baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Thank you, Brother Yaden, and it is so good to be here. I'm just delighted to be with you folks. You may be seated. And uh, my wife and I always enjoy coming, as I mentioned last night, to the Idaho camp. We feel at home here, and so many wonderful folks that the Lord has brought together here at this camp and in this district. We're glad about that. Appreciate the invitation to come and minister uh, in this daily Bible lesson. I I enjoyed Brother Friend's ministry last night so much, and and he made some comments about the importance of the Word of God, and it is indeed the Word that will keep us. There's no substitute for that, and so uh, I'm glad to see you here today to look into the Scriptures, and we will be doing that. Um, I'll try to be sensitive to uh, you to the leading of the Spirit of the Lord as far as the time is concerned. Now, they told me I've got till 12 noon, but um, we'll, we'll see how everything goes. Uh, as a Bible college teacher, I'm sure you can imagine after a while you do get used to teaching for several hours in a row, and um, it's not unusual for me to teach uh, three or four hours in a row. <laughs> so... Uh, I won't try to practice that on you, but uh, we may take advantage of the full time and go up until 12 noon, and there's certainly that much material to cover. So I'll try to watch you and see how you're doing as we go through the scriptures. Um, let me just mention before we get into the word for today, again, that uh, my wife and I brought a few of our books with us. Some have asked about them, and um, we don't have a big supply. So if you are interested in some of them, you may want to stop by. We'll, we'll stay there at the table in the back under the college banner for a few minutes after the service. We have a few copies, I think only three copies, of my commentary on Proverbs. That's a verse-by-verse -verse commentary about, oh, it's about 300 and some odd pages long, and it goes through the entire book. It has an index in the back of about 318 topics and shows you every chapter and verse where they're found in Proverbs, along with the commentary in the front. Uh, and then um, my book... Um, on practical Christianity called Insights for Christian Living is there too and that has to do with um, matters like uh, what it means to live by faith, the whole armor of God, uh, thinking the right kind of thoughts, just things to do with practical Christianity. Uh, then I have a few copies of um, my book on um, the trustworthiness of the scripture and Bible translations and that. And then there's uh, a book there called um, Hair Length in the Bible which is kind of a revision and expansion on an older book that I had written, which this one came out about two years ago. And there's some other things there. So you may want to, I'd much rather you take them home with you than me haul them around with me this summer. We have a long distance to go yet, so uh, you may want to stop by and see if you, if you want to do that. Um, also, for those who may be interested, and I realize the young people are not here now, but some of you may be parents, we do have information there too on the college, and we'd be happy to talk with any of the young people about that. Now, let's get into the Word of the Lord today, and I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Colossians. Uh, as I sought for direction for this week, uh, it seemed that the right thing to do was to take this New Testament book, the book of Colossians, which is rather a short book, it has four chapters, and to spend our time together in this book. Now, I don't believe we're going to be able to cover the entire book. There's so much uh, here for us to explore and things from other books to bring together with it. But there are some specific reasons why I want us to look at the book of Colossians. I'd just like to share them with you by way of introduction before we actually get into the book. Uh, the book of Colossians presents probably the most advanced Christology or doctrine of Christ of any New Testament book. Now, there are references to the deity of Christ and to his identity in 
many places in the New Testament, but as far as bringing it all together in one place and distilling it and condensing it, as it were, in one very brief place, the book of Colossians does that more than any other book in the New Testament. It presents Jesus Christ, of course, as being preeminent. In fact, this is where the statement comes from, that in all things he should have the preeminence in everything. Uh, this is where the verse is found, for in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, also the verse, where it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. There are numbers of references in the book of Colossians to the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he is what the Christian experience is all about. And I believe that is a message that we need to have renewed to our thinking today. Uh, a few weeks ago, and I hope that what I'm going to say here will not uh, be misinterpreted or taken in a negative way, but sometimes we have to examine ourselves to see what we need to be doing and where we need to go. But a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity at the Bible College to have Brother J.T. Pugh with us. I think all of you know him. Brother Pugh is a wonderful and faithful man of God and has a very good reputation among us and is not known for flights of fancy and, and that sort of thing. He was with us to speak at our baccalaureate service, and I had the opportunity to take him out to lunch uh, afterwards, and so we talked for quite a while. Mostly Brother Pugh talked, and I listened. I don't feel qualified to have anything to say when I'm in his, his company, and uh, I just wanted to, to draw all that I could from him. And among other things, Brother Pugh offered to me an assessment of a current problem that we face. When I say we, I'm talking about us, oneness, Jesus' name, people. Uh, his assessment was that we are, we tend to be issue-oriented and even organization-oriented and not Christ-oriented. His assessment was that we know a lot about Christ, but we really don't know him very well. And there is a great difference in knowing doctrine. Now, doctrine is essential. It's the structure. It's the framework uh, of the church. But um, it is possible to know doctrine and yet to miss the reality that the doctrine is supposed to convey. And the doctrine concerning the oneness of God, while it is certainly true biblically, uh, just like any other doctrine, could become an end in itself and we could fail to recognize what that doctrine represents to us, which is that Jesus Christ is everything. That he is, that he is all in all. That he is to be the center of all of our affection, our attention, our worship, our conversation. That Jesus Christ is what this is all about. And I would not want to be guilty of being able to explain theoretically the doctrine of the Godhead and yet to miss what it means in a, uh, in a practical way in my life and experience with God. You probably are all aware of the fact, in fact, you know people who have fallen away from their relationship with the Lord and yet who could still explain to you, at least in some terms, something about the oneness of God but it's not doing them any good experientially. And this book of Colossians, uh, first of all, we will see in the first chapter, uh, and then on into the second, the book of Colossians presents Jesus Christ as being uh, the center of attention, as being preeminent in every way. We'll look at some of those ways. And for that reason, I want us to examine this book. I am concerned, I'm, I am a third generation uh, oneness Pentecostal preacher. My grandfather was uh, a oneness Pentecostal preacher. Passed away in 1959. My father, who was still living, is a oneness Pentecostal preacher. He's been pastoring for 30 some odd years. I've been preaching now for about 27 uh, years. And uh, so I've been around long enough, I think, to be somewhat acquainted with us. I consider this my family, my home have no interest or desire for anything else. But I am concerned um, that there may be a lack of focus on the Lord Jesus Christ as a person. If 
I can use that word of him. And I want to be sure that I do whatever I can to avoid that problem continuing if it is a real problem. Then the next reason that I have chosen the book of Colossians is because uh, Paul gives this news about Jesus Christ as being preeminent for a reason. The reason was at Colossae, which was a town of some substance and some importance commercially in what we call Asia Minor, it would be in modern day Turkey, a town which was located about 10 miles from another very well-known New Testament town, Laodicea, which appears in the book of Revelation. Also about the same distance from another uh, town that's mentioned in the book of Colossians called Hierapolis. And those two towns were close together but on opposite sides of a river which uh, ran near Colossae too. Um, in this city, there was apparently false teachers or a false teacher, maybe just one individual, we're not certain about that, who was presenting doctrines which sounded good to the human mind, to human wisdom. They were doctrines which seemed to breathe some sort of extra dimension of spirituality, some sort of closer uh, relationship with God or something that lifted you above the norm or made you, sometimes I hear these terms even today, kind of a church within a church or some special little select group uh, these doctrines took the form, as we will see later, not today, but later in the week, uh, of three heresies. Number one, legalism. Number two, mysticism. And number three, asceticism. And uh, don't worry so much about the terms right now, but let, do let me say this. When you study church history, you realize the truth of Solomon's statement, there is nothing new under the sun. Because every false teaching and every heresy that has ever, uh, or that is around us today, is not unique with our day, but can be seen far back in church history, even to the earliest days. In fact, it is my belief that virtually every false teaching that crops up in the church today uh, can be put into one of these three categories legalism, mysticism, or asceticism. And while all of them sound good, the problem with them is they draw attention away from Jesus Christ and they place attention on us as individuals. Instead of putting the attention on the Lord Jesus and what he has already accomplished on our behalf, they tend to focus attention on us and what we can do for him. Now, that statement may sound a little strange to you. You may think, well, aren't we supposed to be doing something for him? Well, actually, we're supposed to be laborers together with him. And those things that we do are supposed to be the result of the living Christ in us. As he lives in us and works in us, as Paul says in another place, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. As he works in us to give us right desires and right abilities. And those are the only works that bring any glory to God and can be used by Him to advance His purposes. Anything else is useless as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. But these three false teachings of legalism and asceticism and mysticism have, as Paul says in the book of Colossians, a great show of wisdom. And that makes them attractive to human flesh because they are natural vehicles for the expression of pride. In other words, if I can impress you with how spiritual I am, or if I can impress you with, the, with what I'm doing for God, and probably in impressing you make you feel guilty because you're not doing what I'm doing, if I can do that, actually what that is is an operation of pride in wishing to hold myself up as the example rather than holding Jesus Christ up as the example. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed during my lifespan is that whatever I'm doing in my Christian walk, and I'm using myself as figurative now of all of us, whatever I'm doing, that's what I think everybody else ought to be doing. 
And however God is dealing with me, that's the way I think he ought to be dealing with you. And if I have found a formula, if I have found a little, you know, A plus B plus C equals D and it works for me, then I think that you ought to use that formula too and it ought to work for you. But formulas do not work. The only thing that works is a relationship with Jesus Christ. What Christianity is all about is the Lord Jesus Christ living in us and through us and relationship with him. And so we'll be talking about those, um, those three problems. Um, let me say one more word of introduction. There was an ancient heresy which actually comes along after the completion of the New Testament in its full-blown form called Gnosticism. Gnosticism is from a Greek word, uh, gnosis, which uh, simply means to know. And Gnosticism was a, a teaching which held up secret knowledge as being the key to spirituality. Secret knowledge or secret information of some kind. Even today, uh, you see, really, you see Gnosticism at work in the secret lodges. I'm not here to talk about them, but, you know, with the secret handshakes and the little secret sayings and passwords and all that kind of thing. That's, that's really a modern-day form of Gnosticism, secret knowledge, secret information. But uh, another problem with Gnosticism was the belief that all material uh, creation was inherently evil, including your body, that your body was inherently evil, that everything that was material that you could touch or handle was inherently evil, sinful. And so Gnosticism, as a result of that, took one of two forms. It either it took the form, although this is not so much a problem for us today and was not the major thrust of it, it took the form that since uh, only the spirit matters, that it makes no difference what we do uh, with our body. It makes no difference how we treat it or how we live with it or whatever. Uh, that the only thing that mattered was just the spirit man. But the more common uh, position of Gnosticism and the one that we see roots of here at Colossae and in other places in the New Testament, was that since the body, they taught, was inherently evil, therefore anything we can do to punish the body or to make the physical body I'm talking about now suffer is good. That was their teaching. Of course, that isn't true. But that was the roots of the early monasticism, the, the founding eventually of the monasteries, fellows who moved out into the deserts, into the caves and so forth and lived on diets of uh, very very limited food and, and so forth, thinking that somehow they were going to become more spiritual by doing that. Jesus obviously never did that. He didn't think that that was true. He lived among the people, walked among them, uh, ate with them, and etc. Uh, but then Gnosticism also taught that since the physical body is evil, that Jesus could not have come in a physical body. Therefore, uh, the teaching was he came only in an appearance of a physical body, that Jesus looked like a man. He would appear to be a man as far as your vision was concerned, but that if you went up to him and perhaps tried to pat him on the back or something, that your hand would have passed right through him because he was just a phantom, just a spirit being that looked like a human being. And they had to believe that because they believed that the physical body is evil, and so they couldn't believe that Jesus was actually uh, in a physical body. Now, that is a part of the doctrine of Gnosticism that uh, John wrote against in the little epistle of 1 John. He starts off in verse 1 talking about the Word, as, as in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. talks about the Word, but he focuses on the fact, he, he says concerning the Word, we have handled him with our hands. We have seen him. We have handled him. Then he says in 1 John chapter 4, about the first two or three verses, he said, whoever teaches that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh is Antichrist. You see, we have to remember while Jesus Christ was fully God, and he was, he was also fully man. He was an authentic human being as much as any of us in here today. 
just as much as he was authentically God. Now therein is the mystery, Paul says, of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now, when we see the word flesh in Paul's writings, most often it is a reference to the human nature. Most often. Now, sometimes it is a reference to all that it means to be human. Sometimes it is a reference to the physical body. Most often it's a reference to human nature. Now, many individuals who are confused on this point and think that the human body is inherently evil and therefore we must treat it harshly some way to get some sort of victory, don't realize that Paul used the word flesh to speak not just of the body but of the fallen human nature that we inherit from Adam. Now, I just want to say to you now, we'll talk more about it later, your physical body is not inherently evil. It is a miracle of God, as David says in the Psalms, even in the womb before we were perfectly formed, God was there shaping us and molding us. And in that context, he says, how marvelous are thy works, my soul. He says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It doesn't sound like he's talking about something that's inherently sinful. The physical body itself is good. That's not your problem. Your problem and my problem is the fallen human nature or the sin principle, which is frequently called the flesh in the New Testament in Paul's writings, that we inherit from Adam. We'll talk more about that later, but that's just a, a little background about all this. Now, I have uh, spent some time studying the book of Colossians, concentrated on it for several weeks. Not that I've mastered it at all. There's so much there. But I just want to give you maybe a few little statements, and if you're taking notes, you may want to write them down. Uh, I have kind of, for my own purposes, given a title, uh, a descriptive title to the book of Colossians, which covers the whole book. And that is Christ over human doctrine. Christ over human doctrine and human effort. Christ over human doctrine and over human effort. That really, I think, distills the message of the book of Colossians. Now, if you let's, let's think for just a moment, first of all, about the term human doctrine. There is such a thing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, talking to the Pharisees, who were quizzing him about why his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. And it wasn't that the disciples were dirty and ate with hands that were actually dirty and unclean. But it was that they didn't bother with the ceremonial cleansings of the Pharisees. That was the, the complaint the Pharisees were making. When they asked Jesus that question about why the disciples did not obey the traditions of the elders, Jesus responded in Matthew 15 and said, how is it that you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Then he quoted from the Old Testament and said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's Matthew 15, about the first half dozen verses. So Jesus himself recognized there could be such a thing as the doctrines of, and commandments of men. And then also he pointed out that if we embrace these human doctrines that do not originate with the Word of God, that they will inevitably cause us to transgress God's doctrine in His Word. It is an, it is an inevitable result. Whenever you embrace a human doctrine, now you may think I'm just going to add this on to God's doctrine, but it doesn't work that way. Whenever you embrace a tradition or commandment of men, it will inevitably cause you to violate God's principles and doctrines somewhere down the line. Recently, I was involved in a research project which uh, led me to using uh, what is known amongst the Jews as the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is supposedly 
the oral law or the oral traditions which were handed down from Mount Sinai, from Moses to his successors to their successors right on down till the time of Jesus Christ, and which were put into writing along about the year 100 A.D. The Mishnah is a collection of Jewish traditions and doctrines and teachings on all kinds of things. Some of it's serious, some of it's humorous, it's just all kinds of stuff that has been handed down through centuries of times, uh, time among the Jews. The Mishnah forms the basis for what uh, is more popularly known later as the Talmud. You may have heard of the Talmud. Well, that that's the uh, uh, Jewish traditions, commentaries upon them, expansions upon them, elaborations upon them, all this kind of thing, trying to find applications for these traditions. I was reading in the Mishnah the other day, and in one of the books, the book of Abo, the very first verse of the Mishnah, uh, of this particular book in the Mishnah, claims that these traditions were given orally at Mount Sinai. Now, the Jews would tell you the Hebrew scriptures, that was the written revelation. But in addition to that, there was, they say, an oral revelation that was not written down at that point in time. It was just passed down orally by tradition, and the Mishnah is it. But in that first verse, this phrase appeared, that these oral commandments are given so that we might build a fence around the law. Now, you may have heard that term at some time or another. That's not, that term did not originate with anybody today. That's in the Mishnah from uh, millennia ago, that we would build a fence around the law. The idea is, here's the law in the Hebrew Scriptures. To them, the Bible is the Old Testament. And now, we must elaborate on that. We must expand on that. We must add to that. So that, let me just give you some illustrations. Uh, in the law of Moses, one of the commandments, the fourth commandment, was remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We'll be talking more about the Sabbath as we get into Colossians 2 because it appears again here. But remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And all God said about it really in the Ten Commandments was, on this day thou shalt do no work. Just rest. You your family, your animals, it's just a day of rest. Now, originally, when God gave the Sabbath day commandment, it was not to be a day of worship. A lot of folks don't realize that. They think the Sabbath is a day of worship. But that developed during the exile, when the Jews were taken away from their temple in Jerusalem and the development of the synagogues while they were in Babylon and Assyria. The synagogues were meeting places places of teaching, places of socialization, and so forth. And what they began to do, since they didn't have the temple and they weren't in the land, they would meet together on their Sabbath day for instruction and for worship. And so during the time of the exile, the Sabbath day became a day of worship. But it was not that originally. God's original commandment was a day of rest. And the reason for that is what it symbolized. And we'll talk about that more later in the week. But it was not enough to the Jews just to have this commandment to rest. Instead, they added to that hundreds of laws as to how the Sabbath was to be kept. For instance, amongst the Orthodox Jews, it was permitted on the Sabbath day to spit on a rock. But it was not permitted to spit on the ground. What's the reason? This is the Mishnah. The reason is... If you spit on the ground, it makes mud, and that's work. But if you spit on a rock, it doesn't make anything. So you just better hope, if you need to spit, that you can find a rock on the Sabbath. Now, that's just, that's just one of, of many typical uh, commandments. Uh, also, uh, it was considered illegal for an Orthodox Jew to touch dirt or to touch spit or to touch a blind man. All of that's forbidden by Jewish tradition. Of course, you see what Jesus thought about that when he spit in the dirt and made mud and rubbed it in his hand and then put it in the eyes of the blind man. It's like Jesus was just thumbing his nose at the traditions 
of, of the Jews and saying, here, take that, seeing how much of it he could, uh, you know, he could do. Now, it, it's hard for us to imagine he would do that, but really, if you read carefully the Gospels, you find that Jesus had no regard whatsoever for the traditions of the Jews. He could have tried to accommodate himself to that. He could have told his disciples, now, look, we don't want to offend these guys, but he didn't do that. Instead, on every occasion, he showed them the emptiness of their commandments and how their commandments had caused them to violate the actual intent and spirit of the Word of God. Now, the Pharisees were human beings. We're human beings. There's really nothing new. We have to be careful that we are not guilty of the same kind of thinking. It's the Word of God that abides and endures forever. Not anything we may add to it or say about it. Now, I think I can say this because I have written some books. But my books, compared to Scripture, are worthless. Absolutely worthless. You could get along without anything I've ever written or that anybody else has ever written if you had the Word of God. All those things are just helps. I've... I heard a preacher say the other day, I can't, it's hard to believe he was serious, but he acted like it. He had written a little book, just a little short, kind of a little pamphlet on something. And he actually said, I believe this is the greatest book written since the Bible. Well, I'm not going to be buying this book, I, as far as I'm concerned. Just that statement indicates to me it's probably not worth much of anything, because he probably doesn't have a whole lot of appreciation for Scripture itself if he thinks his book is the greatest book since the Bible. Uh, the Word of God is not to be added to. It is not to be taken away from. It is not to be compromised in any way. Uh, I'm remembering right now uh, a preacher related to me. This is a true story. Uh, this happened a number of years ago. A little lady in his church was very zealous for God and very zealous to bring people into the truth. And they had a visitor. A gentleman visited their church service one evening. And this little sister went up to him, and she was trying to convince him that he need to be baptized and so forth. And, and she said to him, Now don't you know that Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. She added something to what Jesus said. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. But she added in that second phrase, But he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. This pastor overheard her. And he went up to her and asked her, He said, Now, sister, why did, you, why did you do that? Why did you say that? She said, Because I didn't think it was strong enough the way it's written. Well, if it's not strong enough the way it's written, you've got a problem. Because the Bible says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. In fact, it's even worse than that. In the book of Revelation, the warning against adding to or taking away is such that if you take away anything, uh, the, John says your, your name would be taken out of the book of life. Now that's a pretty drastic statement. And that if you add anything to it, the plagues that are written therein would be added to you. Well, I'm not interested in any of that. So as far as I can in my weak and frail human ability, as God helps me, I want to stay true to the Word of God, true to the Scripture. And so I've given this book of Colossians, just for my own sake, the little title, Christ Over Human Doctrine and Over Human Effort. One of the things that I've been convinced of for years, and I'm more convinced of all the time, I alluded to this earlier this morning, is that the only effort that counts in God's kingdom is the effort described by Paul when he said, I have labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which worketh in me. And as he says in another place, he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ.
Christ liveth in me. What I'm convinced of is that our task is primarily to get out of the way and let the Lord Jesus live through us. Our task is not to try to perform for Him, but to let Him work through us to accomplish His purpose. Our task is basically one of yielding, as Paul says in the book of Romans. He says, yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It's not a matter of us taking the bull by the horns and forcing something. It's a matter of yielding to Him so that He can use us in all of our facilities, however He wants to, to accomplish His purpose. Praise the Lord. I believe that's what the grace of God is all about. And then I've also given some subtitles to this book. You may want to make a note of this. Starting with chapter 1 and going through the end of chapter 2. Uh, just for the sake of identifying this section, the first two chapters, I have identified it as the exalted Christ. What you're going to see as we go through this, chapter 1 and chapter 2, exalt Jesus Christ. And then chapters 3 and 4, the practical chapters, I have subtitled, Live Life. First of all, we have Christ exalted in chapters 1 and 2, and then we have the challenge in chapters 3 and 4 to live like Christ. Actually, if I could put it in another way, what Paul is going to do in this book is show the Colossians what they are positionally in Christ already. Then he is going to encourage them to become practically what they already are positionally. Now, it is often difficult for us to realize there is a separation between those two things. We are not striving at this moment to be accepted by God. We are not striving at this moment to be justified. We are not striving to be forgiven or redeemed or whatever. All of that is already accomplished on our behalf by Jesus Christ. That's accepted. But what we now face is the opportunity to become in our daily living what we already are positionally with God. To allow that to be working out through us. And we shouldn't confuse what we're doing with the reality of what God has already done for us. In other words, if we think I've got to reach this point or do this thing before God will be pleased with me, we will forever live frustrated defeated, depressed lives. But if we recognize we are already fully accepted in Jesus Christ, then we are released from pressure and from guilt and from condemnation to become freely and joyfully what we already are positionally with God. And if you try to, if you try to approach it in the reverse, it'll never work. Uh, it, uh, the result of all that will be condemnation, frustration, and so forth because you can never be good enough. You can never do enough. Regardless of what you do, everything you do opens the door for opportunity to another thing. And so if you haven't done everything there is to do, there's always something more to be done, and so there's always a reason for condemnation over what you haven't done. If you have been a good Samaritan to one broken down motorist along the road, there's always another one you haven't been. If you have said a kind word to one person in need, there's always a hundred more you haven't said a kind word to. There's always more you could do. And it is my opinion, as I look at Paul's epistles especially, that the message is, get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on Jesus Christ and then He will be able to do with you and through you what you could never be able to do by your own efforts and ingenuity. Hallelujah. Now here in the book of Colossians, let's just start reading. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll read along here for several verses that come back and make some comments, starting in verse 1 of Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, 
to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is more or less a standard opening in the epistles. And for that matter, it would be somewhat a standard opening for any letter or epistle being written by anybody to anybody in the days of the New Testament. Uh, the custom was to put the name of the author or the writer of the epistle first. Today, when we write a letter, we put our name last, but their uh, form was to put it first, and that's what you find here. Uh, what you're going to see Paul doing in chapter 1 is preparing the Colossians for his warnings in chapter 2 against these false teachings. He's going to lay the groundwork for that. And let me just say to the preachers here today, there's real value in this. Before Paul issues any sort or any form of rebuke, he first commends the Colossians for those good things and positive things uh, he has heard of among them. Uh, there's, there's value. Before you tell a person what he needs to do, uh, even if you're dealing with your children, parents, it's good to recognize the right things they're doing first. A lot of times our kids get the idea that all we ever see is what they're doing wrong, and they never can do anything right, because that's all we have anything to say about. But really, your children are probably doing many things right. You just never mention it. You just take that for granted. But wisdom would be for you to commend an individual for what he's doing good before you correct him for what he's doing wrong. That's just something that Paul frequently does in his letters. Now Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, which itself is a significant statement. Remember Paul also said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In one place he's giving his... Uh, giving in Philippians, I believe, giving his background. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was very much committed to what he later called the Jews' religion. As you know, he was active in persecuting the church. The reason he persecuted the church is because he did not believe for one moment that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He thought he was serving and worshiping Jehovah God, or Yahweh, whichever you prefer, the God of the Old Testament. For Paul, who had been a Pharisee of the Pharisees, who had all of the pedigree, knew what tribe he was from and all that business, for him to come along and say, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. If we had no other statement about the deity of Christ in this book, that statement alone is a powerful testimony to Christ's deity. Because Paul, as a Jew, who believed in absolute monotheism, and no doubt who, like all Jews of his day and Orthodox Jews of our day, who had on his lips the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night, the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. For Paul who believed in that monotheism strictly to say he was an apostle of Jesus Christ when he would not for one moment have stooped to serve anybody other than the true God is a statement of Jesus Christ's deity. The Jews were very much opposed to the idea that they served anybody but God. And even when the reality of political situations around them uh, said that they were under the heel of Roman oppression, they still claimed they were nobody's servant. In the Gospels, for example, in a, in a uh, confrontation with Jesus at one point in time, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the Jews said, free? <laughs> in essence, what are you talking about? We are not servants to anybody. Well, of course, at that very moment, uh, they were living under the domination of the Roman Empire. and uh, But they, they didn't want to recognize that. And the reason for that was because they saw their service being given to God alone, the true God of Israel. But Paul inserts this statement. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. There's so much here. I appreciate that statement because...
something Paul uh, dreamed up himself or, or brought to himself or did by his own power or will. Later in Colossians 2, we will see a, the word voluntary appear a couple of times. The word voluntary comes from the word volition. We talk about our volitional aspects. That has to do with our will. The will is the volition. The word voluntary comes from that. It, so to say I volunteer for something means I, I will, I've made this decision, my will has been involved in this decision to do this thing. Well, Paul does not say he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by his own will. He doesn't say this is something I had as an ambition and wanted to be. In fact, if you had looked for anybody who would have been less likely to be a candidate for apostleship, where would you have looked than Saul of Tarsus? If you had examined the life of Saul, actually now, Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul was his Roman name. He was a Roman citizen, while at the same time being a Hebrew. Some have said, well, his name was changed when he became a Christian. That's, that's not really true. He, both names were legitimate names, but one was his Jewish name, one was his Roman name. And he uses the name Paul most frequently, not exclusively, but most frequently after his conversion because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And that was his Roman name. But anyway, if you had looked at him three minutes before his conversion, you would never have guessed that he was even remotely a candidate to be a Christian, let alone an apostle. But what happened? It was not Paul's will. It was not his initiative. But as he was on his way to further persecute the church, there was a brilliant light that shone from heaven, and God in his sovereignty turned him around and changed him in a moment of time. The man with letters in his pocket to go and persecute the church is now on the ground saying, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, much to his surprise, I'm sure, because Paul, being again a Hebrew and a Pharisee of the Pharisees, when he said, Who art thou, Lord? His question was, Who are you, Jehovah? But the Lord speaks back and says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. By the way, there's good information there because it indicates that Jesus Christ considers whatever to be, is being done to his church as being done to himself. He is that closely identified with his church. He's the head, as we'll see later in this book of Colossians, of the church. And he is united to the church inseparably. And so he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Uh, God was putting things in his path to make it difficult for him to continue in the path that he was going. And so immediately Saul says, what would you have me to do? Now, it, he didn't say, what can I do for you? But what would you have me to do? Let me be doing your will. He is an apostle by the will of God. And I want to say to you that our prayers should not be so much designed to change God as to change us. In fact, the Bible teaches both in the Old and New Testament that God does not change. Malachi chapter 3, Jehovah says, I am the Lord and I change not. The New Testament, Hebrews 13, 8, speaks of Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So our prayers, even as Jesus taught, should be primarily, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. As Jesus himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the uh, anticipation of, of being made sin for us. It was not the physical suffering that he dreaded so much, but he knew what was in that cup. And he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You want to know the real answer, or the real solution to answered prayer? It's in 1 John chapter 5. If we ask anything according to His will, we know that He heareth us. And if we know that He hears us, 
We know that we have the petitions that we ask. Well, how do we know that he hears us if we ask according to his will? So prayer is really, in addition to being fellowship with God and worship of God and communion with God, primarily when it comes to action or something being done, prayer is primarily to change us. Now, God is sovereign. And God will do within the boundaries of His will everything He can do to bring to pass that which would glorify Him. There is one thing we need to keep in mind, however, and that is God will not transgress the free will He has given us. He will not force us or anybody else to do anything. Now, He may make us wish we had done it, but he will not force us to do it. Because in the creation of man, God sovereignly chose to give man the power of choice. And if he had not done that, man would not be man as we know him today. He would be at best a puppet or a robot or a machine of some kind. But inherent in what it means to be a human being is to have the power to choose. And that's why God told Adam in the Garden of Eden, really, I'm paraphrasing, but you have a choice here. Now, there's a choice you must not make, but it is a choice that it's possible to make. And, of course, Adam made that choice. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother, Timothy was there. By the way, the book of Colossians was written while Paul was in prison in Rome. It was written somewhere between the years 60 and 62 A.D. It's a strange thing. When you consider books like Colossians and when you read Revelation chapters 2 and 3 about the seven churches of Asia Minor to realize how quickly, and I cannot fully explain this, but Christianity began with such a wonderful thrust of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Until soon in the book of Acts it is testified by unbelievers these Christians have turned the world upside down. But before the end of the first century, most of those early churches had completely fallen away from their commitment to Jesus Christ and from walking in the truth. You see that again in Revelation 2 and 3, in the seven letters to the churches. Some of them were in better shape than others. It seems incredible to me that that could have happened so quickly after Jesus Christ himself walked on the earth. In fact, in the book of Galatians, Paul says, I marvel. He says, are you so soon removed from the doctrine? I mean, before the New Testament was finished, the churches were already falling away from the gospel message. There's a warning there for us. And obviously the warning is, if, if that could happen to them that early in the history of the church, we certainly need to be alert and aware 2,000 years later when so much has intervened. We have the Scripture, thank God, and even the mistakes of the early church to learn from. I hope we can learn from them. Somebody said that a man who will not study history, and Christianity is involved with the study of our history. We must know it. A man who will not study history is doomed to eternally be a child. You know nothing that went before you. You think the sun rises and sets in you and your circle today. You don't know what your brothers and sisters were doing a generation ago or ten years ago or a hundred years ago. It's very important for us to learn from history. And, of course, what we see in the New Testament essentially is history as it relates to the, the early church. Now, he's writing in verse 2, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae, uh, this word, saints, appears frequently in Paul's epistles. It's interesting to me. It even appears in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians are called saints. Now, when we think of saints, although we are not Roman Catholic, we think of somebody that was just virtually perfect. Sometimes we will even say, you know, St. Peter, St. Matthew, St. Paul. That's fine. They were saints. But I think that our, our thinking about saints has been so influenced even by Roman Catholicism with the uh, canonization uh, 
of certain individuals as saints, and that's only done a long time after they lived, and only if they were exemplary people, and you know, supposedly, and all that sort of thing. So we sometimes wonder, uh, there may be some saints in my church, but boy, there's some there that I, I wonder about them. But read the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul says of the Corinthians, they were carnal. They were divided by splinter groups. Some saying, I'm of Paul. Some saying, I'm of Cephas. Some saying, I'm of Apollos. Some saying, I'm of Christ. They were tolerating sin, open sin, in their midst that was not even tolerated by unbelieving Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 5, and that is that there was a man in their midst who claimed membership in the church who was living in sin with his, apparently his stepmother, his father's wife. Uh, they, were, they were grossly abusing the gifts of the Spirit, grossly abusing the Lord's Supper, all the way through that book, one major problem after another, and yet in the first chapter Paul calls them saints. Now, the reason for that is the word saints has to do not so much with what we can measure up to, but the fact that we are called of God and separated by Him for special treatment and special purposes. It actually comes from the same root word, hagios, that holy comes from in holiness. Primarily talking about separation. And the faithful brethren in Colossae. Now verse 3. Notice the first thing Paul begins to do after this introduction. And I'm sorry, but I won't be able to read every verse, as you can see right away in this book and get through this book this week. But notice the first thing he begins to do is to express his gratitude for the good news he's heard about the Colossians. Now, Epaphras apparently was the founder of the church in Colossae. Paul had never been there at the point when he wrote this book. But Paul had spent two years, Acts 19, he had spent two years in Ephesus, which was only about 100 miles or so away from Colossae. And if you read Acts 19, that was the period of time, you know, when God was working the special miracles by the hands of Paul, and handkerchiefs and aprons were being sent out, and demons were leaving people, and diseases were leaving. And uh, Acts 19 says that while he was there in Ephesus teaching daily, that all of Asia heard the word. Well, this is part of it. Apparently, Epaphras from Colossae was one of those who heard the word from Paul in Ephesus and then he went back to Colossae and to other towns and founded churches there. Now after a period of time when Paul was imprisoned in, Ro in uh, Rome, Epaphras finds his way apparently being imprisoned himself alongside Paul or at least visiting him in prison. And he gives Paul a report about the church in Colossae. He tells them the good things that are going on there, and then he tells them these false teachings that are being promoted amongst the people. And so Paul is responding to that in this letter. He says, verse 3, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Would you notice there that an essential part of prayer is thanksgiving. Prayer certainly should involve a petition, but it should never be without thanksgiving to God. You'll notice also about prayer in verse 3, Paul says, I'm praying always for you. And that's a statement that is very similar to statements that appear in others of Paul's epistles. He says, I'm praying for you without ceasing concerning other churches. Something there I'd like for us to see. There is a teaching know how widespread it is among us, but I've heard this teaching that we should only pray about something once, and after that we ought to forget it, and from then on, not ever ask God about it again, or pray for it again, but just thank God that the answer is coming. Well, Paul apparently hadn't heard that doctrine yet, he hadn't read the books by those that are writing that sort of thing, and so he said, I am praying specific things for you daily without ceasing always. Now there are some things we, we don't need to pray in unbelief, but there are some things we need to pray about every day. There are some things, in my case, that I pray about virtually every day. Now you may feel differently than me about this, but I don't think I always have to dream up a different way of saying it. I'm not a big one for liturgy or memorized prayers or whatever. 
But I don't think that whether or not God hears our prayers depends upon how creative we are in saying it. Or using different adjectives or adverbs or synonyms or something. I'm only mentioning this maybe to save you from some frustration. Some people have said to me, well, I feel like I'm praying the same thing over and over again. Well, there are going to be new things that you pray about as time comes along and new needs arise, but there are some things you're going to pray about regularly. Jesus gave his disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer. And apparently that prayer was designed to be prayed every day. Why? Because in part of that prayer he said, we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now somebody says, well, but we're not really supposed to say those words. That's only the Methodist, you know, that's supposed to say those words because it's so formal. Now, we're supposed to just kind of use that as a guideline. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Because in the account of Luke in giving the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is recorded not as just saying, after this manner pray ye, as Matthew says. But in Luke, Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name, etc., etc. Now, I'm not trying to make a doctrine out of that. I just want to show you that there are certain things, according to Jesus, that should be prayed regularly. And the validity of your prayer is not based upon how verbose you can be or how or praying with a thesaurus in your hand so you can always come up with a new way of saying it. But the validity of prayer is based on faith. If you are praying in faith, God hears your prayer. Hallelujah. So you can release yourself from the pressure of trying to think up some new way to say it or trying to tell God something he's never heard before. Believe me, it's whatever you're going to say, he's heard it before. The human race has been around a long time and there's been a lot of prayers prayed. The issue is not how you say it, it's the faith that is in your heart. And Paul says, I am praying always for you, Verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, now notice verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye have heard before in the word of truth in the gospel. Now, what is, a question here, what is the measure of the New Testament church? Nowhere in the New Testament do you see a church commended by Paul or anybody else for its size? Now, I'm not fighting size because these New Testament churches, most of them were huge, if we can figure out anything from history and the growth rate. But nowhere do you see Paul saying, I thank God because you've got 50,000 members. Because that wasn't the measure of a New Testament church. Nowhere do you see the New Testament churches commended for buildings? Although they did early begin to use house churches and then they developed on into uh, actual church buildings they used even as early as the end of the first century. But nowhere, oh, I, I want to commend you because you folks have completed this marvelous building project. Not that there would have been anything wrong with that, but there, nowhere is that mentioned. And sometimes those are the things we measure a church by, either its physical plant or its number of members. But when you look in the epistles, you see there are three things that are considered by Paul to be the measure of a New Testament church. They are their level of faith, hope, and love. Now don't skip over this too quickly. We just saw all three of these things mentioned here. He commends the Colossians for all three. You read other of Paul's epistles, and he will commend the church for all three. But then you read some of Paul's epistles, and he will commend that particular church for only two of them. Or maybe only one of them. And when that is the case, if you will read the epistle carefully, it seems as if the epistle is written to correct the deficiency in the thing they're not commended for. Let me give you an example. In 1 Thessalonians, the church at Thessalonica is commended, just like the church at Colossae, for its faith, hope, and love. But in 2 Thessalonians, if you read the opening chapter, the church is commended only for its faith and love, not its hope. 
what is the book of 2 Thessalonians written for and about? It is written to respond, apparently, to a false epistle under Paul's signature, which said, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, that the day of Christ was already at hand, or that it was already there. This false report had robbed the Thessalonians of their hope. Until that time, they'd been looking forward with great anticipation to the coming of the Lord. And in 1 Thessalonians, they'd been taught by Paul that about the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But that the rapture would occur before this wrath of God came on the human population at large. He says in chapter 5, God has not appointed us to wrath, and etc., and uh, destruction will come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and all of that. But in the meantime, after 1 Thessalonians, they got this letter. And it said Paul, just like his other letters. You can find this in 2 Thessalonians 2, too. It says Paul. And it says the day of Christ is at hand, meaning it's already arrived. And this robbed them of their eager anticipation of the future. And so he wrote 2 Thessalonians to correct that false impression and to put them back on the right path and to restore their hope. Now, if you'll look carefully at the epistles, you'll see that kind of a pattern emerging. And again, maybe let me just say to the pastors here, it is my opinion that if we would focus our ministry, always focus our ministry, whatever we're going to preach about, whatever Bible book we're preaching from, if we always focus either on faith or hope or love, we will be helping our people to grow spiritually and we will be meeting their needs from the Word of God. Because those are the three things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, abide. He says, now abideth faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity, or love. Those are the three abiding factors. So the measurement of a church is not so much its membership or its physical plant, but the measure of a church is how is it doing in love, how is it doing in hope, and how is it doing in faith? And all ministry, teaching and preaching, should be designed, although it may involve rebuke, even as Paul does and etc., but it should be designed eventually and ultimately to build the people up in their faith and their hope and their love. Now, uh, verse 6. He says, which is come unto you. He's talking about the word of truth here. He's coming to them. As it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Now why is Paul saying this? One of the things we sometimes fail to think about when we're reading the Bible is what was the intent of the author. Now this is an important part of hermeneutics. Not just what, what does it say, but what was the intent of the author in saying this? Why did he say this? Why did Paul remind the Colossians of this word of truth which came to them as it had in all the world? Most likely speaking of all the known world of that time. Producing fruit. That is, whatever this word of truth was, it was working. It was producing something. And it was doing the same, both in all the world and in them, from the very first day they heard it, it produced fruit. From the very first time they knew the grace of God in truth. Why does he say this? Because these false teachers were coming in. And they were saying, yeah, what you've got now is good. In fact, if you study Paul's ministry, it appears that there was a group of Judaizers, legally. Now, they were professing Christians. They professed that Jesus was the Messiah. They had been baptized. They had received the Holy Spirit. But they apparently followed Paul around. And wherever Paul had been, they would follow him up and say, Now, what Paul told you is good and true and fine and wonderful. Believe it. But in addition to that, they would say, you need to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. You see this in the book of Galatians. You see it in Acts chapter 15. The reason Paul here reminds them, you've already heard the word of truth. 
It is already bearing fruit among you and indeed in all the world was to show them they didn't need anything else. They didn't need what the legalist had to offer. They didn't need what the mysticists had to offer. They didn't need what the ascetics had to offer. They had already heard all they needed to know from Epaphras. In fact, look at verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. He's laying the groundwork here, pointing out to them, folks, you have already heard what you need to know. When you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it is producing something among you. Don't turn away from that and embrace other things and add these other things to it because Jesus Christ is all you need. That's his basic message. He'll continue to elaborate on that. Verse 8. Who also, Epaphras that is, declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Paul, uh, Epaphras told Paul uh, some good things about the Colossians. Their love, which was prompted by the Holy Spirit, their faith, their hope, and etc. Now verse 9 Paul is going to detail the contents of his prayer. There is a little phrase I just want you to remember as we read through this. Two words. Worthy walk. You're going to see this. Worthy walk. Paul is going to tell them there is a walk that is worthy of the Lord. There is a walk that is the right walk. It is the one that the Lord deserves for you to walk in. And he contrasts this to this unworthy walk of legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. Now, let's begin in verse 9. We'll notice about this worthy walk, what all it includes. First of all, we're going to see the cause of it. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Again, he's praying for them ceaselessly and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, it's apparent here that Paul is using some words that were used especially by these mystics. They talked a lot about wisdom. And Paul uses the word wisdom. But he contrasts the true wisdom of God to this false wisdom of the mystics and ascetics. He says, I am praying. Now what's my prayer for you? You really see something here in Paul's prayer because it shows us what's really important. I would suggest to you, you may want to use some of Paul's prayers as guidelines for your own prayers. Personally, I don't think there's anything in the world wrong with praying the prayers of the Bible. In fact, I think in most every case, they're better than any prayers I could possibly imagine myself unless it's about some personal need that I have or something specifically I know about because these are inspired of God so he says I'm praying for you first of all that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will now notice according to Paul the will of God is not something so ethereal and so distant and so far out that it's impossible to know and it's not something you get by reading tea leaves or by going to the palm reader, or by just, you know, the hunt and peck method of Bible study, just opening up your Bible and closing your eyes and pointing. Now that really is an occult practice. It's not found out by numerology, astrology, horoscopes, or anything like that. The will of God is discovered primarily by and through prayer. And if you're not willing to pray that God would show you His will, it's probably better, although it's not good, it'd be better just not to worry about His will at all, because if you go seeking God's will in some other fashion, you're going to be misled and deceived, most likely. So Paul says, I'm praying that you would know the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10, here it is, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, what does this worthy walk come from? First of all, the worthy walk comes 
from a full knowledge of the will of God. When you have a full knowledge of the will of God, and only then will you be able to walk worthy of the Lord. Now, I want that to sink in. Because again, we sometimes confuse walking worthy of Him with something we can do externally. No. There's nothing you can do externally to make you worthy of God. To walk worthy of the Lord is to walk according to His specific will for you. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever He is leading you to do, it's to do that thing, and that's walking worthy of the Lord. Now, what are the characteristics of this worthy walk? First of all, in verse 10, notice the worthy walk pleases God in every way. Did you know it is possible from this verse for you to actually please God in every way? There are many of us who have given up on that because we don't think we could ever do it. But it can be done if you are walking this worthy walk. The point is, God does not expect more out of you than you're able to deliver. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, God remembers our frame that we are dust. Now you may have a pretty inflated view of your own importance and ability, but God has a much more realistic view. He because he, he knows because He made you. And He knows what He made you out of. And He remembers that you're a human being. He remembers that you are dust. In fact, the book of Psalms says, God has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. It's a good thing He hasn't. Or none of us would be around here today to even be thinking about the Lord. The worthy walk is a walk that fully pleases God. I want to stress that. I want you to know that there is a walk with God where He is not disappointed with you. Now, there are so many of us who feel no matter what we do or how well we perform, God is really disappointed with me because I'm not doing everything I could be doing. But if you are walking this worthy walk, He is pleased with you. He is happy about that because you are walking in His will. I believe there is a relationship with God you can have where there need not be any tension between you and God, where there not be any frustration between you and God. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. I do not believe you may have a different opinion and maybe I'm wrong. But I don't believe sinless perfection is possible for us human beings on this earth. When the New Testament talks about perfection, be ye perfect as your Father is perfect and etc. In the Sermon on the Mount, the word perfect is talking about maturity. It's talking about spiritual growth. It's not talking about sinlessness. Because by virtue of being a human being, you are not going to be perfect. From time to time, you're going to fail. And it's going to be more than just a mistake. From time to time, there's just going to be a plain old sin you commit. And it may not be robbing a bank. It may not be committing adultery. It may not be smoking dope. But it may be a little tinge of pride that gets in there. Which is the most deceptive of all sins. And just when you think you don't have it, that, well, that's when you've got it the most. And uh, uh, it's, it's part of what's in this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If there may be a little wrong thought or something, or, or, or whatever it could be. But you don't have to depend upon your perfection to please God because the perfection of Jesus Christ has been imputed to you just as your sins were imputed to Him. Last night, Brother uh, uh, Friend read it right here, 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses. That God hath made Him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Hallelujah. Now, if you really believe that our sins were imputed to Jesus Christ, and I, I know that you believe that on the cross, then you've got to also believe that His righteousness was imputed to us. It was the great exchange, as somebody said. Hallelujah. And that is the basis upon which God looks at us today. And if we are walking in the will of God, uh, the worthy walk, it is pleasing to God. The word in the Scripture, it is all pleasing. 
Now the next thing you see about this worthy walk in verse 10 is it produces fruitfulness in every good work. It says being fruitful in every good work. Now, the word fruit is not an unusual word in the New Testament. Galatians 5, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. John 15, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. And uh, the branches must bear fruit. Uh, if you examine that passage carefully, the fruit seems to be tied up closely with Galatians 5 because he talks about joy, he talks about love, and etc., Fruit is not something you strain to produce. It is not something you strive. It is not something that comes forth even by self-discipline. Now, a sinner out there on the street can smile at you if he wants to. But that's not the fruit of the Spirit. He can be kind and nice and say, good morning, and how are you? And if you're an old lady, he can help you across the street. And all that's good, and I'm for all that. But that's not the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not just good manners. It's not just knowing how to behave. It's not just self-discipline. The fruit of the Spirit is the product of the Holy Spirit being in us. And by definition, it does not come by straining or struggling. It comes by natural result of growth as we walk with the Lord. You don't walk by an orchard and hear the trees groaning to produce, straining, struggling to grow apples or whatever kind of an orchard it may be. They grow apples because they're an apple tree. We produce the fruit of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is in us, because we are Christians. It's a natural result. And I want to say here, too, I do believe in teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. I've written on it and so forth. But there's always the danger if you focus on the result too much. You're going to defeat the very thing you're trying to produce. If you're constantly asking yourself, do I love enough? Am I joyous enough? Do I have enough peace? All these are things in the fruit of the Spirit. Am I long-suffering enough? If you're constantly asking yourself that, what you'll wind up doing is trying to be more loving, trying to be more joyous, trying to be more long-suffering, and you'll be able to do that for about two weeks. And then they'll come and haul you away in the straitjacket. Because these are not things you can do by human effort. They spring out of a relationship. Relationship is the key word. You know, I, my wife is here today, so I can say a few things uh, like this, I suppose. My wife and I have been married almost 28 years. The reason I love my wife is not because there is a little card somewhere with a commandment on it saying you've got to love your wife and you must do these things to show your love the reason I love my wife is because of the relationship I have with her and the commitment I have to her and the things that I may do from time to time to show her that love is not because somebody demanded that of me but because of the love the things that I don't do from time to time to show her my love is because of my human frailty. <laughs> she can tell you what those things are. Like not stopping to get her a hamburger a couple nights ago. That sort of thing. Uh, but the point is, any time you reduce a relationship to a legal document, you have robbed it of its vitality. You have robbed it of its meaning and its purpose. You have mistaken the result for the reality. And even in the fruit of the Spirit, these are things that naturally spring forth from a life in fellowship with Jesus Christ. So rather than focusing so much, although I do teach on it, I've written about it, but rather than focusing so much on love, you know, I'm commanding you love, I'm commanding you be joyous, I'm commanding you be at peace, I'm commanding you be long-suffering, Rather than, suffering on, uh, rather than focusing on that, we ought to focus on our relationship with Jesus Christ, and these things would come forth from that just almost effortlessly. They are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, 
If you walk this worthy walk, you will be fruitful in every good work. Next, the next point in verse 10, if you walk this worthy walk, you will constantly increase in your knowledge of God. Notice it. It says increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, I'm not talking here, and I don't believe Paul is talking, about academic knowledge, just of doctrine. Now, nobody believes in doctrine more than me. I teach most all of the theology classes at Christian Life College, and I teach doctrine. I teach the oneness of God. I teach the Christology, the pneumatology, all of that stuff. But this statement here is not talking about an increase in academic knowledge doctrinally. It's talking about increasing in knowing God himself. The knowledge of God is knowing God. Now, you talk about somebody that knew doctrine. It was the Apostle Paul. He's the greatest theologian that ever lived. We get much of our theology from him. And yet Paul himself said, after a life of doing theology, he said, oh, that I may know him. You see, there is always a cry in the heart of the believer to know God more intimately, to know him better, not just about him, but to know him. And if you're walking the worthy walk, one of the results of that is you will increase in the knowledge of God. Not only that, verse 11, if you're walking the worthy walk, you will be strengthened with all might. Hallelujah. According to whose power? His glorious power. I hope today, if I can do nothing else, that I can draw your attention away from yourself and focus it on Him. Away from your own strength to His strength. Away from your ability to His ability. Because the Christian life cannot be lived by you or me. There have been sinners who have come into our churches from time to time, or maybe who refuse to come, who say, I can't live the Christian life. You know what? They're absolutely right. The only person who can live the Christian life is Jesus Christ. And the only way the Christian life is going to be lived through us is if He lives it through us. And so as we walk this worthy walk, it will be that we are strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. And what else will it produce? Verse 11, the worthy walk will produce patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Now, if we look back in history, there was a group of philosophers known as the Stoics. There was also the Epicureans. The Epicureans were those whose basic philosophy was eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And so the Epicurean philosophy was to indulge the physical senses. The Stoics, on the other hand, were just the opposite. Their idea was that we ought to oppress human emotion, that we ought to oppress our senses. Keep a tight rein. I know a lot of people like this today. Keep a tight rein on your emotions. Keep yourself under control. Don't ever let yourself get out of, you know, out, out of hand. That was the story. You hear that, you get the bad news that someone dear to you just died? Don't cry. Or you get the news that, you know, the next runner comes air and he's left everything to you. Don't get excited. <laughs> you know, just keep it all in control. That was a stoic philosophy. But in contrast to that, Paul says that the worthy walk will produce patience and it will produce long-suffering, but these will be mixed with joyfulness. One of the characteristics, what part of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And it should characterize the Christian life, and it will if we take our focus off of ourselves and put it on Jesus Christ. The surest thing that will kill your joy 
is to take your focus off of him and to put it on you or somebody else and to try to do it by your own power. You cannot be happy that way. Now, verse 12. You going to make it for another 17 or 18 minutes? I can make it if you can, okay? Uh, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now the worthy walk will produce thankfulness to God. All of these things will just breathe through you if you are walking this worthy walk. The things that will breathe through you will be an awareness that God is pleased with me. As shocking as that seems at first, because of how we've all been so influenced by this idea, oh, I'm just an unworthy worm and, you know, God could never love me. But, but these things will just be saturated through us and awareness, God loves me. God is pleased with me. There will be fruitfulness in every good work. We will constantly grow and increase in our knowledge of God. We will accomplish the things we do through the strength of His power. We will be patient and long-suffering and yet joyous and live a life of gratitude and thanksgiving to God if we're walking this worthy walk. Now, verse 12 is so good because it tells how we are qualified for this worthy walk. Because I know even, even as I'm talking, some of you are probably saying, boy, I could never measure up to that. Well, the good news is you don't have to. Not something you measure up to. This verse says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us, past tense, it is already an accomplished work, it is finished, He has made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. If I have to wait to qualify myself, I never will. But the good news is, God made me qualified through Jesus Christ. Now, it's a mystery how that happened, but I'm willing to accept it because it's my only hope. Now, verse 13 continues this theme. Who hath delivered us, past tense. This is not something we're struggling for. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, by the way, before you came to Christ, according to this verse in Ephesians 2, you were under the power of darkness. The power of the enemy. The spirit, Paul says in Ephesians 2, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But we've been delivered from that. You know, folks, you don't need to worry about what the devil is going to do to you. Now. Now, folks that are outside of Christ ought to be concerned about that. But if you are in Christ Jesus, you don't have to worry about that because according to the Holy Word of God, you have already been delivered from the power of darkness. And you have been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. I am in the kingdom of Jesus Christ today. I am not in the kingdom of the world. I'm not in Satan's kingdom. Whatever he may be doing amongst his folks in his outfit, it's not touching me because I'm in another kingdom. I'm under another king. I have power and authority over me. And that's Jesus Christ. It protects me from the enemy. Hallelujah. It does concern me, too, when I hear so much focus on the devil. And I hear a lot of focus on the devil, it seems, these days. Now, I, be, I do believe there's a real, literal devil, the, uh, Satan. I do believe there's a host of demons and all that kind of thing. I, nobody, You know I was here two years ago and taught about spiritual warfare. I haven't changed my opinion on any of that. I believe in all of that. But I also believe that Satan's power over us was broken and defeated at Calvary. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And I believe that Jesus accomplished what He came to do. I don't think He failed for one moment. Hallelujah. And so I don't believe that I've got to worry about um, what the devil's up to as it relates to me. 
Now, I know the Bible says, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, Satan goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, we should be alert and, and vigilant. And also in James, that we should submit ourselves unto God and resist the devil. I'm fully aware of that. But all of that means he's still out there. He's not in here. See? He's, he's, he's someone to, be, to resist, but he's not someone to think he's right here in our midst or within me doing some nefarious work. I am to be alert to his treachery because, and primarily what that means is we must continue to walk in this thing the way we started in it, and that's by faith. Paul says to the Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you so foolish? He says, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? The key to the Christian life, as it relates to living in victory, is to keep living the way you started out. Brother Friend mentioned it last night, reading from Romans chapter 1. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What that means is, the Christian life from start to to finish is a life of faith. Now the only time you're going to get in trouble is if you try to start living some other way than by faith in God. That's going to be your only problem. Or having begun in the Spirit, if now you start trying to be made perfect in the flesh. But as long as you keep walking in faith, and as long as you are led by the Spirit, you don't have to worry about the devil. <laughs> because you've been delivered from His power. In fact, it shouldn't be a matter now of Him chasing you, but you chasing Him. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, These signs shall follow them that believe in My name. The first thing He said is, They shall cast out devils. That means you've got power and authority over the enemy realm. He, you, don't, he, you don't have to worry about Him. He has to worry about you. Now verse 14. In whom, talking about his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Now, folks, redemption is not something we are trying to obtain. It's something we already have. Now, I've been in meetings from time to time, and you probably have too. We're an evangelist, maybe for a good motivation, but sometimes I think maybe to get a response. It says, how many of you here tonight know of a certainty if the Lord came at this moment, you're ready to go? And I've been in meetings like that, and you have too. It's amazing how few people can raise their hands and say, I know I'm ready to go. I am convinced the reason for that lack of certainty is a lack of awareness of how sure our salvation is. And that it is already accomplished in Christ Jesus. Now, I do not believe in unconditional eternal security. That's not what I'm talking about. But neither do I believe in eternal insecurity. I don't think we always have to wonder, are we saved or not? We should have an assurance so that we know now, if your assurance is based on, did I commit a sin today, you'll never know. The minute the preacher says, how many know for sure that you'd go? Well, immediately your mind is going to go to, you know, I think I was disrespectful to my father today. Or I think I didn't smile at my next door neighbor when I was driving away down the street. Or I think I spoke harshly to my son. Something. There's going to be something come up. The devil will remind you of something. Or if it's not the devil, it'll be your human nature will remind you of something where you're imperfect. But if your assurance of salvation is based on what the Scripture says about it already being an accomplished work, then you can have absolute certainty that if the Lord came for you now, you would be ready to go and be with Him. And I, as Christians, I think we've got to have that awareness. Otherwise, we are going to be constantly frustrated and full of guilt and condemnation. We have to have such certainty that we can say, I know I'm saved. And I know that it is certain. 
and that for me to lose that, it would take a conscious choice on my part to turn away from God, to turn my back on Him, to walk away from Him, to leave Him. It can be done, but it's not as easy as sometimes it sounds. Because God loves you too much. He's going to keep reaching out for you and keep dealing with you and keep attempting to bring you back to Himself, even in that process of you walking away from Him, should you choose to do that in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. This redemption involves the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want to show you one thing real quick before we close. We've got about five minutes here today. Let's let's turn over here, first of all, to Romans chapter 3. Look at this situation about sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. There is something in this verse that I had read, like many of you preachers no doubt, hundreds of times and never noticed it. This little simple statement. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now first of all, we know that's a universal statement. And if we were studying the book of Romans today instead of Colossians, we would discover that Romans chapter 1 shows that all Gentiles have sinned, and Romans chapter 2 shows that all Jews have sinned, and the conclusion is everybody, bar none, has sinned. But now what I didn't notice is this. Up to the comma here, before the word and, the statement is past tense. For all have sinned. That's yesterday. Now, previously, I just assumed the whole verse was past tense, but it's not. After the comma, where it says, and come short of the glory of God, that's present tense. All have sinned in the past, but all of us continually come short of the glory of God in the present. Now, that's borne out by the Greek grammar as well as by the English. And if you have any question about that, you could check... uh, like a New King James Version or something, which will show you that real clearly. The point is, not a one of us, nobody other than Jesus Christ, fully, in every way, measured up to God's glory on a daily basis. You ought to realize that's true when you realize how far beneath God we are. God is perfect. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're as high as the heavens are above the earth, Isaiah 55. Every one of us, at our best, fall far short of the glory of God. Constantly. Well, what can we do about that? Well, we can't do anything about it. But thank God He's done something about it. And we see that in 1 John. We'll conclude with this. If you'll turn to 1 John, and we want to read just a few verses here. The little epistle of 1 John. Chapter 1. Starting at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, first of all, we just saw in the book of Colossians that we are delivered from darkness. We are delivered from the kingdom of darkness. We are translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now, to walk in the light is to walk in the revelation of Jesus Christ as He leads you by His Spirit. It does not mean you know everything. I'm sure every person in here right now knows something today you didn't know a year ago about the Bible or God's Word or the revelation of God or something. It doesn't mean knowing everything. But it does mean walking in the light that God has shown you. Walking in the revelation that you have from the Word of God. Now, if you turn away from that and begin to walk in the other direction, you're walking in darkness. Now, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we're lying. And we're not doing the truth. But verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, now watch this, we have fellowship one with another, and that means we have fellowship with God. He's the antecedent here. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 
Whenever you see in the King James Version that E-T-H ending, like on cleansa, it is telling you something about the Greek tense of that word. The Greek tense of this word cleansa is the present active indicative. What that means is it continues. The Greek has what's called a punctiliar action. That means it happens at one point in time and that's it. And it has a linear action that just keeps going on. An endless line. There's no end to it. And when this says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin, it means not just that He cleansed us yesterday, or He may cleanse us today, but the blood is continually cleansing us from all sin as we walk with Him. Now you say, but now Brother Seagraves, that says if we walk in the light as He is in the light. But you see, walking in the light is not walking sinlessly. If it was, you'd have no need for His blood to cleanse you. You need His blood to continually cleanse you even though you're walking in the light. Do you see that? To walk in the light is to walk in the revelation of Jesus Christ. To follow the light that He has opened up to you. But even though you're walking in that, you are still imperfect. You will still fail from time to time. And so God has made provision for that. Now did you realize that in the law of Moses, there, was, there were sacrifices and offerings for sins you had committed knowingly. But there was also a sacrifice for sins you committed unwittingly. In other words, something you didn't even know. That you should have done or shouldn't have done, but you sinned. And so the law of Moses took care of that. Since the law of Moses was typical in its offerings of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, I can't believe for one minute that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was in any way inferior to the sacrifices offered by the law of Moses. If the law of Moses made provision for sins committed knowingly and unknowingly, how could the blood of Jesus do any less? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I remember hearing old brother Ike Terry saying a little testimony a few years ago at a little church in California where my father was being installed as the pastor. Brother Terry just got up to give a testimony. and He, he brought to our attention the statement of Jesus that when Peter said, How often should I forgive my brother? In one day. Seven times? Uh, the the uh, mission I called for three times. So he thought, well, I'll double that and add one, apparently. And, well, I'll really be forgiven. And Jesus said to him, I say not unto you seven times, but seventy times seven. Now that's a phenomenal thing if you stop and figure that out. If he's talking about every day and it sounds like it, that works out to be about an offense every two minutes. <laughs> but what Brother Terry said was, if Jesus recommended that that's what we should do, would he do any less? I don't think for one moment he'd do less than he commends to our attention. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. My father told me about a pastor that he knows, pastors in a town near him, who says he hasn't sinned in 28 years. Only thing I've got to say is he either doesn't know what sin is, he doesn't realize that sin is anything less than the absolute perfection of God's glory, or he's just making things up, one of the two. Verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to point out something here, and I regret that I just have about 60 seconds left to say it. But this statement about confessing sin, you may wonder in light of what I've just said about the blood of Jesus taking care of even unwitting sins because the law of Moses did. How does that tie with confession? Because if you don't even, if you don't even know how imperfect you are, how can you confess every imperfection? That was the thing that drove Martin Luther almost crazy. He'd go into the confessional when he was still a Roman Catholic monk. He would confess everything he could think of, and it would take him hours. And he would turn to leave the confessional and remember something else. 
And he'd go back in and start to confess it. And his superiors got so frustrated with him, they finally gave him an assignment to teach the Bible, which he'd never studied up till that time. He'd earned his master's degree, but he never studied the Bible until he started working toward his doctorate. And when he started working toward his, toward his doctrine and started teaching the book of Psalms and Romans, light came. <laughs> and the thing about this verse is the word confess means essentially agree. Now we tend to look at confession in the, in the terms of uh, confessing, telling God what we've done. And of course we should do that. We should confess our sins or name them to God when we're aware of sins. But the word that is uh, translated confession here, accurately translated, is the same word for example, in Romans 10, if any man confess Jesus Christ to be Lord. Well, that doesn't mean some sort of repentance. It's talking about if we agree with God about this is what it means. And the point of verse 9 is if we agree with God about our sinfulness, if we agree with God about our weakness, and if we don't pretend to be more than we are, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. In fact, He is faithful, which means He'll do it every time. If there was ever one time he wouldn't, he couldn't be said to be faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's one of the greatest privileges to living the Christian life. Continual cleansing from sin. Let's stand together. We'll pick up from there in Colossians 1 tomorrow. But let's... Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow. Become a servant of righteousness. Keep self pure. Be an example. Have faith in God. Follow Jesus. Put first things first. Resist temptation. Be faithful and be fruitful. <laughs>